Hey guys, in this video we're going to be taking a look at my AR Wing Pro. First of all I'm going to start the video by looking at the crash I had on the maiden day uh, and after that we'll come back and take a look at the wing on the bench, I'll give you a setup walkthrough and also let you know what I think of this wing. So this crash was iNav related, uh, specifically around auto launch, but ultimately it was my lack of knowledge that really caused the crash in the end. So in iNav auto launch we have two throttle values to play with, there's the idle throttle and launch throttle. Idle is what is applied when it's in your hands before you've thrown it and before launch is detected, whereas the launch throttle is what is applied once it detects that you've actually thrown the plane. I've set up this wing with a 50% idle throttle and 90% launch throttle. So you'll see here in a second when I push the stick up that the amps go to around 10 which is the 50% idle, but because it wasn't a very hard throw it didn't detect the launch and it stayed at 50% throttle thinking it was still on the ground as indicated by the fly time still saying zero minutes. Because it was quite a windy day the idle throttle was adequate to keep it in the air. At this point I didn't really know what was going on um, so I'm wiggling the right stick the elevator and aileron to try and get it out of auto launch. I'm also trying to switch into manual and change the modes uh, but I'm getting absolutely zero response. So at this point I think the best thing to do is to turn off the TX and force a fail safe and hoping that it would go into return to home. But unfortunately as I do it just here you can see it goes into emergency landing and all I can do is watch it go into a hedge at 84 kilometers per hour. After this crash I went home and did some testing on the bench and discovered that the very simple solution to this was just to move the throttle stick to zero and then moving the right stick would allow you to cancel auto launch. Unfortunately there was just a lot going through my head at the time. I was using a lot of new gear like a new transmitter and I was using Crossfire for the very first time. And although at the time I was suspicious that launch hadn't been detected, I wasn't really sure. Luckily where I crashed was quite accessible for me on foot. So I managed to retrieve the wing and every single part so nothing was lost in this crash. There was less damage than I expected and it was a really clean break. So actually it glued back together really easy with V6000. I mean this video shows how well it went back together even without the glue. Unfortunately I was left with a hole in my wing where I'd lost a bit of foam in the crash. So I decided to fix this using Gorilla Glue mixed with PVA. Once you put a little bit of PVA glue in with Gorilla Glue and then give it a good mix, this will then expand and fill any gaps while also gluing two surfaces together really well. So I poured a small amount of the mixed glue into this hole and then I covered the front of the wing with masking tape and pinned a piece of foam into the battery bay so that the glue would expand to the profile of the wing and also not fill the battery bay. You do need to make sure you leave some gaps so that the excess can pour out of uh, like you can see here. This is in real time so you can actually see how quick the glue does expand. And at this point I just left it for a few hours to finish expanding and also to dry. Later on I came back and removed the masking tape and this is how it was looking. Then after giving it a bit of a tidy up and also cutting away the excess foam with a snap razor, this is how it looked. Then to finish this off I laminated over the repair and also covered it in black electric tape just so that the beige glue didn't look so out of place. I also laminated the leading edge of both wings because they were looking a bit rough after going into that hedge and I also laminated across the bottom of the plane where the crack was. And here it is on the bench. I don't think it's looking too bad considering it's had a bit of a tough life already. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this wing, give you some details about it and also go through my particular setup. I've also got some new goodies that I was trying out on this so I'll talk a little bit about those. Anything that I talk about um, or mention, I will put a link to those in the video description below. So first of all, this is the PNP kit. So it does come with the ESC, the motor and the servos. Um, unlike, I think the AR Wing 900, it doesn't come fully assembled. So you do have to set up your servos, uh, glue them in and uh, connect all the linkage and also install your motor and your ESC, but that doesn't take very long at all. So to start with, the ESC is a Sonic model, 40 amp ESC with a 5 volt Beck 3 amp. You get a Sunny Sky 2216 and it's 1400 kV spinning an 8x5 prop. And the servos, 
They are Metal Gear and I think they're analog servos, 9 gram. This has a wingspan of around 1 meter, so it's a little bit larger than its predecessor, the AR900. I think 1 meter is kind of a sweet spot really. It's not so big that it needs breaking down to transport, but uh, at the same time it, it's big enough to not get bashed around too much by the wind. Assembling this wing was actually very simple. You have the three parts, the fuselage and then the two wings. There is a carbon fibre spar which runs through here, so you put that in first through your fuselage, slot the two wings on, uh, and also there are um, wing connectors on here, so your electronics like your servos and anything else you have out on the wing, uh, they will uh, automatically be plugged in once you connect the wing to the main body. Next you actually need to install the servos. So what I really like is the servos you place into the bottom side of the wing, but the arm actually comes upwards and through the wing, so it's kind of a really nice low profile here. And installing these servo horns is really nice as well because on the other side, I will just flip this over, there's a carbon fibre spar that you glue into the elevon. But what it also does is it goes through a hole in the control horn, so that gives it a lot of extra strength. And also, obviously, the spar is giving a lot of strength to the elevon. And over here there are a couple of thumb screws and these are basically holding the wings in place so if you want to be able to detach your wings uh, it's as simple as just undoing those screws and pulling the wings off. After that you fit the supplied winglets just using a couple of screws on each of them and basically the wing is assembled minus your electronics. This thing has a ridiculous amount of space for fitting electronics I've counted something like seven compartments for installing them uh, and on top of that you have a number of different camera mounting options. So firstly you have this little GPS holder here and then underneath this hatch you have another little bay where you can put your ESC and I believe some people even put their flight controller in there. And you've got the main compartment which will, for most people will store your flight controller and then your flight battery. You also have these side compartments on the fuselage and the really nice thing about these is they have a nice amount of cool air flowing through them so if you've got a component that's going to get hot this is a good place to put it. Uh, and you have another one on this side which is where I have my VTX. And then out on each of the wings you see there's a piece of foam which you can pop out and that allows you to mount another component here and you can run your cable through this channel and there is already a servo extension waiting there ready for you to plug in whatever it is you want to put out in the wing. And then when you look inside the main fuselage, these servo extensions are already in place linked to the wing connectors, so they're ready for you to plug into your receiver or flight controller. Then for your camera mounting options, you have two different canopies. So I've gone with the standard one, but there is another one that is designed for mounting the DJI HD system. Um, and also you've got this, this part here, which is designed for your HD camera and it comes with some foam inserts so that you can change this according to the camera you have. And then also there is this slot here for your FPV camera. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick overview now of the parts I've used and where I've installed them on this wing. Um, starting at the back here, I've got the 220 GPS receiver there in the dedicated GPS bay. These things are just dirt cheap, they're so small and light and they work perfectly. So I pretty much install them on every one of my builds these days. Uh, flight controller, I have a Matek F722 uh, and it is in one of my uh, 3D printed holders. For my video transmitter at the moment, I've just switched to um, one of my old Aonway 600 milliwatt 5.8 transmitters I had lying around. Um, for the first few flights and for the Maiden, I was actually using this 1 watt VTX that the guys at Panda RC sent me. So I'll come back to that and talk a little bit more about that later. Up the front here, I am running a DJI Osmo action for the HD, um, which is on the heavier side of the HD cameras, but I think that is what's helping me get CG quite nicely um, with this Lion Pack. 4S2P 7000 milliamp. Um, basically, this goes in where it's designed to, in the uh, kind of on this battery holder, and I pretty much get CG nicely 
with it there. I know some people have been struggling with that and having to add nose weight when they're using the lighter HD cameras. So that's just something to look out for when building one of these. Then for my FPV camera, you can't really see it very well in this light. Um, it's covered up in black tape, but uh, that is the Cadax Retel 2. And that is another new bit of kit, which I will talk a bit more about later. And then finally, um, I have the Crossfire receiver out in the wing. And again, that's another new piece of kit for me because I have only ever used 2.4 or Dragonlink. Um, so this is my first time using Crossfire. So I will also talk a little bit about that shortly. And another new bit of kit that I'm using is I have one of these RadioMaster TX16S radios. So uh, I'll have a little bit of chat about that as well. Okay, so my final thoughts on this wing. Uh, most of this is positive. It's really hard to find anything negative with this wing, to be honest with you. Um, I really love the air-cooled side bays here. Great um, solution for mounting components like VTXs that are gonna get hot. There's just so much option for mounting all your gear. You've got this big compartment here, the one at the back. Uh, also the ones out on the wings even you've got a dedicated spot for your GPS uh, you've got this uh, little shelf here which pretty much takes any of your HD cameras so your Osmo action your GoPros and your, kind of your GoPro session or run cam 3 style you've got a dedicated analog uh, camera bay here you've got multiple hatches the one with just the air scoop or you've got the one that will hold your uh, DJI uh, air unit, or even if you wanted to stick a run cam 2 on it, you can do. Um, and I also really like the design of the servo mounting, uh, the way that the uh, they're kind of nice and low profile, and also that the servo horns uh, nicely link in with the carbon spar for extra strength. I really like the design of the winglets on this one, um, because I found with the AR900, having foam winglets that go up and down, it meant that I was causing damage to them on landing, so I had to laminate them. Whereas these ones that just go up, uh, you're less likely to damage them. Although I have managed to pull one off already um, by somehow ending up upside down on landing. Um, I also really like the fact they've thought about the uh, portability of this wing for people that do need to take it apart for transport. So a couple of thumb screws underneath and the wings come off. And that's where your wing connectors um, become really valuable. Really nice, saves you time and effort. And allows you to keep electronics out on the wing with very minimal effort and on top of all of this it just seems to fly really well um, I find it a lot more stable than the AR900 I think they've chosen um, a good motor and prop combo for this wing it it's not super fast but it's fast enough and also seems really efficient uh, with me being able to get um, a one hour flight time out of my uh, 7000 milliamp uh, lithium-ion battery most of my flights with this so far have been in really high wind due to the bad weather we've had here so far this year and I'm just so surprised with how well it does handle the wind for a wing of its size and weight so that's really impressive. It doesn't seem to have any bad flight characteristics and it just seems to be a very good all-rounder. Um, as I've already proven it seems to be able to take a crash quite well. Okay the nose came off but it seems to have gone back together really easily. Um, so I think this wing is just, it kind of keeps maybe uh, more advanced pilots entertained. But at the same time, I think this would just be ideal for beginners. I can also see now why this wing was voted the number one wing of the year in the iNav fixed wing group on Facebook. Um, if you're into your fixed wing and or if you use iNav or both, it's a really good page on Facebook. So I'll put a link to that in the video description. Please check it out. And I guess the last thing I forgot to mention that I like is these hatches uh, and the way they come off and go back on really nice quickly and easily and snap into place with the magnets and it's the same for the back one there. And in terms of bad things to say about this one, um, it's really hard to kind of say anything negative to be honest with you. Uh, my only thing I noticed with this wing was that in comparison to the AR900 I kind of found it hard to throw uh, for launching it. I kind of had to hold it here but it just didn't quite feel as good as with the AR900 where it has the part on the bottom that you can grip quite easily. I mean this is a really minor thing because it's still not hard to throw and launch. Um, and the other thing that 
kind of worried me at first was actually just that this piece of plywood is uh, glued onto the foam. Um, and I was thinking if it was a crash, that, that might come out quite easily. Um, but I've already had a crash and uh, that stayed in. In fact, the whole nose came off. So yeah, I'm really struggling to think of anything else negative, really. So that's kind of my summary of the wing. So let's just move on to looking at the new bits of electronics that I've been trying on it. So the guys at Panda RC sent me this one watt video transmitter, which I wouldn't usually go for these big power transmitters, but I never really get too much luck with 5.8. So I thought I'd give this a try. Um, it basically has a switchable uh, power output from 25 milliwatt up to uh, 1000 milliwatt. Um, you can use smart audio and to change the channel and the power through your uh, TX and through iNav. And also it has this kind of big built-in fan. Um, so the built-in fan will run no matter what the temperature or the power output. So I tested this on the first few flights and basically one of the issues I'm having with it is there are lines down the screen, sometimes vertical, sometimes kind of diagonal. And I've chatted to the guys at Panorasi and they can't seem to um, give me any advice that will help solve that. Um, so I can't really get past that, which is why it's no longer in the wing. In terms of range, I have to say the range was quite impressive. I was probably getting further on 5.8 gigahertz than I ever have been with any of my other video transmitters. Um, I did go and have a look at another review of this uh, this particular transmitter. They seem to have the same lines running down the screen, which kind of concerned me. I see a lot of comments from people stating that he should be using an LC filter or something along those lines. However, I tried that and it did not solve the issue. So great for the range. Have I got a faulty one? I'm not too sure. Um, but I just couldn't get rid of those lines and the guys at Panda RC couldn't seem to help me out either. So unfortunately I can't really recommend this one. So in here I have the Rattel 2. The Rattel 1 is one of the cameras I used in a recent comparison comparing four of the top cameras and I have to say it was performing really well and was probably the better of the four um, if you were to give an all-round score. So I was very excited to see what the Rattel 2 would, um, would, be, would be like and so far I have to say I'm very impressed. It kind of feels very similar to the first one however I have noticed um, some small improvements uh, one of them being around the wide dynamic range for example when you're flying right at the sun it really deals with the light extremely well so at the moment I honestly think it's hard to find a better analog camera on the market than the Rattel 2 so I do highly recommend this one. So the other new bit of kit I've been trying out is the Crossfire for the first time. So uh, anyone that follows my channel will know that I mostly fly with Dragonlink and occasionally 2.4. So I'm kind of comparing this to Dragonlink really, that's kind of my baseline. And first of all, I mean, I had to put a micro SD next to this nano receiver um, because they're just insanely tiny. Um, so I'm running Crossfire Nano on this AR wing. This is the bottom side here, so run the cable along here. And what I did was I took this foam insert out and all I did was actually just cut a little bit off each side of it so it could go back in because that Nano really needs hardly any space in there. Uh, and then I've got this Immortal T antenna out in the wing. So, so far my thoughts on Crossfire. First of all, I love how easy it is to bind to these. Um, not only is it super easy to bind, but once you bind your transmitter to a receiver, if the receiver needs an update, your light just flashes on the back of the transmitter to tell you. You click the button and it updates it wirelessly, basically on the, on the fly. And that's just, that's just brilliant if you compare it to the Dragonlink where I have to hook it up to my old Windows PC and download the software and run it through a configurator. So it's super user friendly and easy to set up to start with. It's super light. I think these nano um, receivers, I can get them in the UK for around, I think it's around 27 pounds with the antenna. So that's pretty cheap and they're readily available unlike the Dragonlink gear, which is kind of hard to get hold of. So big bonus there. 
Another thing I really like about the Crossfire system is how easy it is to configure your uh, receiver or your transmitter through the Lua scripts in OpenTX. Again, means you don't need to use a PC and hook the PC up. That's just a massive bonus, I love that. So my Crossfire TX is the Micro V2, um, which I really like how nice and compact it is, uh, just fitting in this module bay on the back of my TX. So that's really nice. Um, this goes up to one watt um, with the latest firmware, which I do have installed. So far, I've only had the power up to 500 milliwatt. Uh, I do run it in dynamic mode, and I haven't really had chance to push it and really test the range so far. I've only taken this to, I think, about four and a half kilometers, um, and I was still seeing a link quality um, of 99% at that range. So. Uh, so far it looks promising, um, but I think the real test will come in when I get chance to uh, try this on one of my low river runs, um, which Dragon Link never lets me down with. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to trying that and seeing how I get on with it. So the last new bit of kit I'm trying with this AR Pro is the Radio Master TX16S. So I have been with the Tyrannus for a very long time now, so interesting to try something new. and. The first major uh, benefit I see to this obviously is this really nice looking colour screen. Um, apart from just looking nice, uh, it just makes it a lot more user friendly as a radio. Uh, the menus are bigger, you can fit more on the screen for your displays. Uh, and also I like the button layout and this scroll wheel uh, just makes life a lot easier when you're doing config on this radio. In terms of the gimbals, um, I think they don't quite feel as good as the ones on the Tyrannus, but I think it's just maybe a, the intention could be increased a little bit to feel a bit more like this one. Um, and also, uh, something that kind of really threw me off actually when I was having my first flight was there's no kind of ratchet and clicking on the throttle uh, as standard. Now, that's just a kind of case of opening that up and I can fix that, but I just haven't got around to it yet. Um, I would have liked that to have been there as default, but hey, I'll open up the radio and I will sort that. Um, the only other thing I don't like quite as much on this one is maybe these little sliders on the side. They just don't feel as good to me and I kind of find it harder to feel where the center is than on these kind of dials on the Tyrannus. But that's just kind of really minor things there. Um, but apart from that, I think it's a really kind of nice radio, and if it remains reliable, I probably will end up switching to this as my daily driver. Something else that I really like about this radio is that you charge it through a USB-C port in the bottom here, um, which just means that when I'm in the field, I can actually mm -hmm. charge that using a USB cable and a power bank that I usually carry with me. Um, and powering this uh, radio, there's a holder in the back that comes with the radio, uh, and it takes two of these 18650 lithium ion cells. Okay, that's definitely enough talking from me, so let's check out this wing in action. This first clip here is from the Real Maiden. It was actually the second flight that caused a crash, but you'll also see some clips here from after the repairs. Thank you for watching.